President Trump's former lawyer, Jenna Ellis, who defended the president during his efforts to expose fraud in the 2020 election, has accepted a plea deal and agreed to cooperate with the government in the ongoing trials against Trump and his associates. As an attorney who is also a Christian, I take my responsibilities as a lawyer very seriously, and I endeavor to be a person of sound moral and ethical character in all of my dealings. In the wake of the 2020 presidential election, I believed that challenging the results on behalf of President Trump should be pursued in a just and legal way. I endeavored to represent my client to the best of my ability. I relied on others, including lawyers with many more years of experience than I, to provide me with true and reliable information, especially since my role involved speaking to the media and to legislators in various states. What I did not do, but should have done, Your Honor, was to make sure that the facts the other lawyers alleged to be true were in fact true. In the frenetic pace of attempting to raise challenges to the election in several states, including Georgia, I failed to do my due diligence. I believe in and I value election integrity. If I knew then what I know now, I would have declined to represent Donald Trump in these post-election challenges. I look back on this whole experience with deep remorse. This is a very sad scene, not even just for Jenna. Regular regular viewers and listeners to this show know that Jenna is a friend of mine of quite some years now, and she's appeared many times on this show, including immediately after she was indicted. What is sad is not even that she took some deal or other, that she pled guilty to some minor offense, in this case, just one count of, quote, aiding and abetting false statements a far cry from the RICO charges that the Georgia DA is preposterously attempting to pin on Trump and his lawyers. What's sad is not even that she will now face probation and pay a fine and write a letter apologizing to the state and potentially testify against the remaining defendants up to and including potentially the former president and current GOP frontrunner. What is really sad is the disgusting regime that we are living under. We have long complained about unjust laws and the two-tiered system of justice and the creeping corruption pervading the whole system, certainly the liberal elite. But we have now reached the stage of Stalin-esque show trials. The political opposition prosecuted on bogus charges and made to cry in front of a courtroom and on the big state-backed media and beg forgiveness for the egregious sin of being a lawyer and representing a client, a client who at the time was the duly elected sitting president of the United States and who now would dare to run against the current occupant of that office. What's really sad about the show trial of my friend Jenna Ellis is not even that this is how this whole sorry spectacle is ending. What's really sad is that Jenna's coerced struggle session is only the beginning. I'm Michael Knowles. This is The Michael Knowles Show. Welcome back to the show. A young man has gone viral for criticizing Hillary Clinton to her face and raising questions about Hillary's warmongering. And obviously that man has been placed on suicide watch. So we'll get to that in one second. First though, a lot has happened over the last 24 hours, especially on Capitol Hill. A lot and absolutely nothing have both somehow simultaneously happened on Capitol Hill. Byron Donalds is a young conservative. Uh, you know, he's, he's only been in Congress since getting elected in 2020. He's uh, quite right-wing, uh, popular with the conservative, more Trump-leaning faction of the GOP. He threw his hat back in the ring to run for speaker after Jim Jordan ended his speaker campaign, after Steve Scalise ended his speaker campaign, after Kevin McCarthy was kicked out as speaker by Matt Gates and a handful of conservative Republicans and the Democrats. 
Chip Roy, who's a great conservative member of Congress, he endorsed Byron Donalds, but then Byron didn't manage to secure the GOP nomination to become speaker. There were a bunch of good candidates for that nomination, a bunch of solid conservatives, and instead of nominating one of those conservatives, the GOP conference in the House decided to nominate Tom Emmer, who's a big squish. Tom Emmer is this Republican who is on leadership track, who is absolutely, I'm not saying he's the single worst choice that the Republicans could have picked, but he's not far from it. He was able to secure the GOP nomination for speaker on the fifth secret ballot in a face-off against Representative Mike Johnson, who's a Louisiana Republican, who is way more conservative than Emmer and who is all around a pretty solid pick. Tom Emmer, last December, voted to codify quote-unquote, same-sex marriage into law. Tom Emmer, not that long ago, this wasn't five years ago, this wasn't 10 years ago, obviously, Tom Emmer just 10 months ago voted for a bill so egregiously liberal on an issue so profoundly fundamental to politics, the nature of marriage, that Barack Obama, at the beginning of his second term, might not have voted for it. Tom Emmer decides that he wants to be the Speaker of the House. With Republicans like Tom Emmer, who needs Democrats? And with Republicans like the ones who voted for him to be the speaker choice, who needs a Republican majority in the House? So Emmer gets the nomination. This is all happening yesterday, by the way. Then Donald Trump, who is the leader of the Republican Party, whether people like it or not, he comes out and he says that Tom Emmer stinks. So he says, I have many wonderful friends wanting to be Speaker of the House. Some are truly great warriors. Rhino Tom Emmer, who I do not know well, is not one of them. He never respected the power of a Trump endorsement. (laughs) Of course, Trump immediately makes it about himself. Not about the Rhino part, he makes it about Trump. He goes, he never respected the power of a Trump endorsement or the breadth and scope of MAGA, make America great again, very true. Uh, He fought me all the way and actually spent more time defending Ilhan Omar than he did me. He's totally out of touch with Republican voters. That's true. I believe he has now learned his lesson because he is saying that he is pro-Trump all the way, but who can ever be sure? So true. There are a lot of people who hated Trump in 16, then they liked him or pretended to like him in 2020, and now they hate him again. Uh, So who can ever be sure? Has he only changed because that's what it takes to win? The Republican Party cannot take that chance because that's not where the America First voters are. Voting for a globalist rhino like Tom Emmert would be a tragic mistake. Absolutely right. Trump was correct here. Even if Trump was correct for the wrong reasons, and I'm not saying he was, he may have been correct for the right reasons and certain selfish reasons, but even if he were correct for the wrong reasons, he still made the right call in the end, which is often the case with Donald Trump. He said, Tom Emmer doesn't like me, so I don't like him. I say Tom Emmer's a big squish, so I don't like him to be the speaker nominee. Either way, we've arrived at the same conclusion. And it turns out the GOP conference did as well. Because no sooner was Tom Emmer nominated to be the House candidate for speaker, then he was booted out of it. He dropped out of the race because he didn't have the votes. So then what happens? Well, all within the span of about 24 hours, we now have a speaker nominee. And just when things were looking terrible for the conservatives, just when it looked like Matt Gates's political career was over because he booted out Kevin McCarthy, who was way better than Tom Emmer, who was better than having no speaker whatsoever, just when things were looking totally bleak, a ray of hope showed up, which we'll get to in a second. First, though, when you want to hire people, whether for the Speaker of the House or just for your own company, you got to check out ZipRecruiter. Right now, go to ZipRecruiter.com slash Knowles. We do things differently here at The Daily Wire. We host several of the top news podcasts in the world. We launched a chocolate company overnight. We just took Disney head on by releasing 100 episodes of kids content. It takes very specific people with very specific skills acquired over a very long career to make The Daily Wire what it is. How do we find and hire these people with ZipRecruiter? That's how. ZipRecruiter makes your whole hiring process faster and easier. Their powerful technology works for you to identify people whose skills and experience match your job. ZipRecruiter saves you time by letting you easily invite top candidates to apply for your job so they're more likely to apply sooner. ZipRecruiter is trusted by over 3.8 million businesses for their hiring needs. Make a positive impact on your hiring future with ZipRecruiter. Four out of five employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate within the first day. Go to ZipRecruiter.com slash Knowles to try ZipRecruiter for free. That is ZipRecruiter.com slash K-N-O-W-L-E-S. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. I think now we're on our 57th speaker candidate. 
for the Republicans, something like that. I, I think at least half of my colleagues have been nominated and lost at this point. I don't know. At what point do I, I think I might be nominated. I may have already been nominated and withdrawn. Who knows? It's happening so fast. But finally, we've got a speaker nominee who's pretty good, Mike Johnson. Think about just the amazing back and forth here. You have Kevin McCarthy, who's not great, but he's better than recent Republican speakers, and he's certainly more conservative than guys like Tom Emmer. Then they boot out McCarthy, and who do we get? We get Steve Scalise, who's also kind of squishy and not particularly conservative. Well, that's no good. But then we get, who do we get? We get Jim Jordan. Jim Jordan's great. Love Jim Jordan. Very conservative, solid guy. But then he doesn't have the vote. So then who do we get? We get maybe Byron Donalds. We get maybe Bergman. We get maybe this guy. Maybe, okay, now we get Tom Emmer. That's terrible. Now we get Mike Johnson. Mike Johnson is really solid. He is a Christian conservative Republican. He is pretty rock ribbed as far as I can tell on all of the issues. Uh, so he would be a good choice. We will see if he gets the actual votes that it takes to become speaker. With Tom Emmer, there were all sorts of red flags, but the biggest one to me was his vote for codifying into law this radical, preposterous redefinition of marriage that says that marriage is not, as it has always been for all of human history, a union between a man and a woman, but it is now, because some liberal says so, a union between two guys or two women or a man and a woman or, soon enough, three dudes and a billy goat. And that's a big red flag because while the squish Republicans say, oh, who cares? It's a social issue. How does it affect you? You know, just get, stop, mind your own business. Who cares about that? People who have ever thought seriously about politics for even 30 seconds recognize that the fundamental social institution probably has an effect on politics. That the bedrock atomic unit of society which is the family, the definition of the family, the nature of the family, probably has some effect on politics. And if Kevin McCarthy voted against redefining marriage, Kevin McCarthy, and don't even just tell me that it's because Tom Emmer represents a liberal district. He doesn't. He represents a conservative district. Kevin McCarthy is from a liberal state. Kevin McCarthy is from California. And yet Kevin McCarthy, the supposedly awful, squishy, establishment, rhino, liberal, he knows what marriage is. He voted with the conservatives on marriage. Tom Emmer voted against it. And, and I suspect the reason Tom Emmer voted against defending marriage and voted in favor of radically redefining it is because he, like so many Beltway people, think that the wave of social liberalism is e impossible to oppose. And it's just a messy issue. And look, we all have a gay cousin. And so we don't want to be mean to our gay friends. And we think it's somehow cruel to tell people the truth about a fundamental institution. And, and so can we just ignore it? And move? It's, it's been decided. Let's move on. We heard the same thing about abortion in Roe v. Wade from the same kind of squishy Republicans. They said, oh, it's a messy issue. And if you, if you defend babies in the womb, you're being cruel to women. If you defend the real meaning of marriage, you're being cruel to people who have divergent sexual desires. It's a lie in both cases. To defend innocent life in the womb and outside the womb is not cruel to women. It's compassionate and charitable because it's truthful, because babies are babies and we know it's wrong to kill them. Defending the traditional meaning of marriage, what marriage re actually means, is not cruel to anybody. It's not cruel to people who have divergent sexual views. It's charitable. It's compassionate because it's truthful. You're not saying you want to take gay guys and throw them off rooftops. You're just saying, hey, man, marriage has a meaning and it, it can't be changed because it speaks to something that is fundamental to human nature and certainly fundamental to society because men and women are different and complementary that the union between a man and a woman is special, and it's different than the union between two men and two women. Those unions, whatever they are, they're not the same thing because men and women are different. That's compassionate. If you believe that it is compassionate to tell men who are that they're if you, if you can at least side with the conservatives on the then it is a, if you follow that, instinct to its logical conclusion, you have to side with the conservatives on marriage because the point is the same. The basic point in both cases is men and women are different. 
This issue is not going anywhere. Just because Anthony Kennedy rapped poetic when he was sitting on the Supreme Court and he wrote odes in Supreme Court decisions about the constitutional right to intimacy that we all have, man, you know, with the universe and the vibes. Uh, that doesn't change anything and, and the issue is not going to go away. Just as Roe v. Wade didn't take the issue of abortion off the table of political debate, so too Obergefell and this ridiculous act passed by Congress with the approval of Tom Emmer, it's not going to take marriage off the table because marriage is fundamental. Can you imagine the hubris? Can you imagine the pride of thinking that <laughs> the, the, the fundamental institution that has endured for all of human history everywhere on earth can just be changed willy-nilly overnight by a handful of wacky liberals mostly on the Supreme Court and some others in the Beltway, and then there will just be no pushback and that's it? Can you imagine the hubris? I, in fact, we can, because we see this kind of hubris and pride come from Washington politicians all the time, but it doesn't make it real. Now, speaking of love and marriage and the baby carriage, there's a new study out that shows you the reality of mass migration. You know, we've dealt with mass migration for something like 70 years now, and it just keeps increasing over time. I remember a few years ago when we were rending our garments and gnashing our teeth because there were 2,000 illegal aliens crossing the border every day. That was such a record high. We were so shocked by that. And then the number crept up to 2,500, 3,000, 3,500. Well, now here are the numbers. Over the last 12 months, the Biden administration has welcomed at least one economic migrant into the United States for every newborn baby in the United States. For every one new baby born in the U.S., you get one new economic migrant. Not some poor woman fleeing persecution, not someone seeking political asylum, not a little doe-eyed dreamer. We're talking just plain, regular old, often fighting age, often male economic migrants coming into the country. One for every newborn baby. One for every high school graduate in the United States. The liberals always talk about a conspiracy theory called the Great Replacement. And they say that the, the Republicans are peddling a conspiracy theory called the Great Replacement. And it's a white supremacist, neo-Nazi, racist, this is, that is. And I can't quite tell. What does that mean? Does it mean that the policy of mass migration is being used to displace the current population? And because of declining, cratering birth rates among the native population, in fact, replace the native population with foreigners from other countries? How, how, how could you call that a conspiracy theory in the face of this study and so many other studies like it? That's just an empirical fact. Foreigners are replacing the native-born population of the United States, and this isn't happening merely accidentally. It's happening as a matter of policy from the very top of the U.S. government. When Joe Biden says, come across that border, even when he sometimes contradicts himself and he says, oh, we're going to build a wall. We got to take care of this. But they're not actually doing that. And sometimes they're explicit about it. And they say, come across that border. Yes, flood in. Diversity is our strength. We're a nation of immigrants. We don't, borders don't work. Walls are cruel. Don't, come on. No human being is illegal. You're all future Americans. You're all dreamers. In fact, we are going to ignore the constitution. This is Barack Obama admitting this. We'll ignore the constitution and just give you the right to stay in the country. This is a, an intentional policy, and they brag about it. But then when you observe it, and you cite statistics, and you look at all the scientific studies, you're a crazy conspiracy theorist, white supremacist, racist, Nazi, I don't know, whatever. Speaking of babies, a lot of people aren't having babies these days because they want to have dogs instead. And I'm not a big dog person. I'm more of a people person. But if you do have a dog, you do have a pet, I want to make sure that you're taking care of that pet. You're giving that pet the very best food, which is why you got to check out Rough Greens. Right now, go to roughgreens.com slash Michael. You know, you know, I'm not, I'm not a dog person, but I am a people person and I care for all living creatures. So I send my stepbrother Rough Greens for his little Australian shepherd, I think miniature Australian shepherd. And because uh, I, I, I don't trust my stepbrother to get him the good stuff. And Rough Greens is the absolute best stuff out there. Naturopathic doctor, Dennis Black, the founder of Rough Greens, is focused on improving the health of every dog in America. 
Dog food may as well be considered dead food since it contains very little nutritional value. Let Rough Greens bring your dog's food back to life. Rough Greens is a supplement that contains all the necessary vitamins, minerals, probiotics, omega oils, digestive enzymes, and antioxidants that your dog needs. You don't have to go out and buy new dog food. You just need to sprinkle Rough Greens on their dog food every day. Dog owners everywhere are raving about Rough Greens. It supports healthy joints, improves bad breath, boosts energy levels, and so much more. Head on over right now and get a free jumpstart trial bag so your dog can try it. Get a free jumpstart trial bag delivered straight to your door in just a few days. Go to roughgreens.com slash Michael or call 844-RUFF123. That is ruffgreens.com slash Michael or call 844-RUFF123 today. Folks, October is almost over. There's no hiding it. Pumpkin spice season is upon us and I have always been fully embracing and living the PSL lifestyle. Now you can too. You go to dailywire.com slash shop, get your hands on the limited edition Michael Knowles pumpkin spice candle. It's everything you need to complete the trifecta and eat, drink, and breathe pumpkin spice. Let me fill your nostrils with my cinnamon vanilla goodness. Don't wait. Order your candles now. They're only available during pumpkin spice season. You want to try to order these in March? You're out of luck, pal. They're only available at dailywire.com slash shop. Mm. Mm. Wow. It's nice. Speaking of babies, there is a meme going around, and it's a meme from a protest. It's a real picture. It was a real photograph that was taken. And it was one of these pro-Palestine marches. And the, the banner that these protesters in the streets were holding says, reproductive justice means free Palestine. And everyone's making fun of this. They're saying, what does that have to do with anything? What does support for abortion have to do with supporting Hamas? A lot of these protests don't seem to make a lot of sense. Like queers for Palestine. And you've got these decadent LGBT LMNOP people with crazy colored hair who do all sorts of weird sex stuff. And they're saying that they support Palestine while if they were ever actually to visit Palestine, they would be hurled from the top of a roof. That doesn't seem to make a lot of sense, right? That's completely crazy. But this one does make sense to me. In fact, this is the only one that makes sense to me because reproductive justice is a euphemism for killing babies, innocent little babies in the womb. And free Palestine, 999 times out of 1,000, is just a euphemism for support Hamas terrorists who target civilians. So in both cases, we're talking about targeting and killing innocent people. That's all that means. So of course that makes sense. Of course, these two groups agree with one another. Similar to how people were scratching their heads when BLM came out and supported Hamas. They didn't just support Palestine. They didn't just oppose Zionism and the historical development of the nation state of Israel or anything like that. They, they openly supported Hamas with pictures of paragliders, the kind of people who landed at that music festival and killed civilians. And they said, we, we stand with Palestine. Why? Because the argument that BLM is making is that America is an oppressive colonial power and we need a total rebellion to unseat the settlers and the colonizers from power. That's what they say, usually in those exact words. And what's the argument for the pro-Palestine, pro-Hamas side? They say Israel is a colonial power established by the British Empire, much like America was, and their oppressors and their settlers and their colonizers, and we need a total revolution to eradicate all of them. And, and not just eradicate an ideology, by the way, but, uh, but eradicate actual people from this territory. So it's, it's the exact same argument that, that is being made by BLM, of course, there is some agreement there. And of course, people who think it's fine to kill innocent little babies in the womb, of course, they, they, they're going to think it's fine to kill civilians in a time of war. They're not going to think twice about it. Now, speaking of killing civilians, Hillary Clinton was just giving a talk at the Institute for Global Politics, and she was fielding questions, I suppose. And a, one brave young man stood up to question Hillary's warmongering. Can you please make a statement about President Joe Biden's speech? This is a clearly is warmongering speech. 
President Joe Biden is calling for $100 billion of funding for Israel, Taiwan, and Ukraine. And we're supposed to just bundle these together and pretend like we're going to rush to World War III and we're all just going to let Hillary Rodham Clinton sir, sir, sit here. And, to to you. Okay. No, so I'm yes. sorry. You know, no, yes. this is not, what, what, this is not no, the way no, to no, have that, a conversation. I'm sorry. If you want my, to have my a conversation, you're no, welcome to come you, talk to you me can, afterwards. You can sit here. Okay, you, right. You're yeah. gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna wait for me, right? I, please, I, I, I don't. I you, do not believe you. I will you. listen to you and I, do, I will respond. I do to not you, believe you. Respectfully, right. I do not believe you. The fact just, of the matter is that the just, American people's voice are what need to be heard. Yeah, because they are being because heard. our president is not speaking for the American people, and well, neither are that's you. That's your opinion. That's your opinion. Yes, that's my but, opinion. But well, then sit down. We've heard your opinion. Thank you very sure. much. For once, I actually believe Hillary. This this man seems incredulous that Hillary will stick around and wait for him afterwards. I think she's going to wait for him. I think she's, he, this man is definitely going to see Hillary again. You know, I'm really sorry to hear about this man's imminent suicide. Seems like a nice enough fella, a little bit excitable, a little bit eccentric, but she, they're going to talk soon. And there, there, there might not be much talking actually in that conversation. I sometimes wonder how I've survived Hillary all these years. I think it's because, I've, I've mentioned this on the show before, but not recently, Hillary and I are cousins-in-law. Uh, on my great-grandmother's side, on my paternal great-grandmother's side, uh, we've got a, a, I've got a relative who married into the Rodham family, and so Hillary is a sort of cousin of mine. And I, I think it's merely because of family ties that she has not just shown up yet in the middle of the night you know, with a mustache on or maybe just a full ski mask and just put that pillow over my head, snuffed out me in this entire show. Thankful, I'm grateful to Hillary for that. Uh, this man, however, does not seem to have any ties of kinship with Hillary. And so I'm not sure that he'll be so lucky. In any case, what does this mean here? What it means politically is that the Democrats are now the party of war. When I was growing up 20 years ago, Republicans were the party of war. Republicans were the party of going in and bombing the Middle East, and they often had Democrat support in those endeavors, but the Democrats had plausible deniability because George W. Bush was the president, and they could say, oh, Bush lied, and he tricked us, and we actually would have opposed the war had we known now. The Democrats were the anti-war party, and the Republicans were the pro-war party. That has completely flipped, just like a lot has flipped in politics since I was a kid. When I was a kid, Republicans, they were the party of the big fat cat. They were the party of Wall Street, party of rich Uncle Pennybags. Democrats were the party of the working man. That has completely flipped. Now, Republicans are the party of the deplorable, irredeemable, blue-collar, disgusting, low-class worker, whatever sort of things Hillary would call them. And Democrats, they're the party of, oh, the ivory tower and the cocktail party set and Wall Street and big business. It was a huge flip. When I was a kid, Republicans were the party of free trade and globalization. Democrats largely were the party of economic protection and skepticism toward free trade. Bill Clinton signed a big free trade deal, but a lot of Democrats were very skeptical of free trade. That's totally flipped. Now Republicans are the party of protection, which is a return to a more traditional Republican view. The Republican Party, in fact, was founded on tariffs. Abraham Lincoln was a major proponent of economic protection and tariffs. Democrats were much more in favor of free trade. Things change, and a lot of people respond to this by saying that it's hypocrisy. It's not, sometimes it is hypocrisy. Sometimes it is, but a lot of times it is not. A lot of times it is because politics is about applying eternal principles to changing circumstances. And so in certain political circumstances, a, a little more uh, trade might be a good thing. A little loosening up of economic controls might be a good thing. In other circumstances, though, it might not be. It's not always hypocrisy here. Uh, however, it is in, in the case of peace and war, this does seem to be a more significant shift than should we open up the trade a little bit or should we increase the tariffs a little bit. This is a recognition that the Democrats are now the hegemonic political power in the United States. Maybe that's been the case for a long time and we just didn't notice it. But the Democrats now having amassed power in 
virtually every single sector of the country. The one area where they didn't have total hegemony was in the military. And even there, you can see the top brass has gone totally woke. Mark Milley whining about white rage and and promoting critical race theory as the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. They seem to have even the military as well. And with that hegemonic power, you're going to see a, a much more willingness to flex that power. And so on the domestic front, you're going to get show trials like we saw with Jenna Ellis and the the tearful forced confession. And overseas, you are going to get war, war, and more war. And and the protesters, the the sincere protesters, the ones who are actually dissidents in our country, they're going to tend to be on the right. Now, speaking of liberal women who want to be president, we've got a thousand candidates for Speaker of the House. We've got a little less than that for president of the United States. We might get a new candidate for president, and that would be Liz Cheney. If it came down to it, even though you disagree with Joe Biden on almost every issue under the sun, other than maybe Ukraine and Israel, would you vote for him over Donald Trump? We're going to see what what happens. We're going to see how things unfold. I think Donald Trump is the single most dangerous threat we face. I would imagine that there will be a number of other candidates in the race. Um, would you be one of them? I think... I'll tell you what I'm what I am definitely going to do. I'm going to spend the next uh, year between now and the election certainly helping to elect serious people, helping to elect sane people um, to of, Congress. Of both parties? Yes. We don't want a situation where the election is thrown into the House of Representatives and Donald Trump has any possibility at all of prevailing under those circumstances. So we've got to elect people who believe in the Constitution and who take their responsibilities seriously to Congress. So I'm going to be spending a lot of time doing that, in addition to other things. But you're not ruling out a presidential run? No, I'm not. <laughs> now, Liz Cheney has been trying to gin up a presidential run for a long time. It's sort of like the, the girl in Mean Girls who's trying to make the word fetch happen. It's not going to happen. No one, there's not going to be a major rally for Liz. We're ready for Liz. It's Cheney time. <laughs> you know what we need now? Cheney is president. Yeah, that's not going to happen. My response to that is LOL. She says, I'm going to elect serious people, sane people. Whenever you hear Republicans using that kind of language, it is a euphemism for electing Democrats. Well, look, I'm not not a turncoat. I'm not a squish. I'm not betraying what I profess to be my beliefs and my constituents. No, I'm just... I just think these Republicans have gone insane. There there have been these sorts of political ads going all the way back to the Barry Goldwater campaign. I'm a Republican all my life, but this Goldwater man, he's totally crazy. So I'm going to only vote for Democrats now. Uh, You you hear it all the time. And you're hearing it today from Liz Cheney. These These are people who give proof of what is called the uniparty. Jake Tapper says, you'll you'll elect people of both parties? Yeah, sure. As long as they're going to stop that Donald Trump, because that crazy Donald Trump, he wants to stop mass migration. He wants to stop perpetual war. He wants to bring manufacturing back to the United States. He wants us to be self-sufficient and not just debt slaves to China. He wants us to be normal. He wants us to live according to an ordinary American life, and he wants to make the country great again. We can't have that. So I'll elect anybody. My number one priority is preventing that from happening, and I'll elect Democrats, and I'll elect Republicans, but I'm mostly going to elect Democrats because that's what side they're on right now. So she says she's going to maybe run for president. The 2024 primary, I think, comes down largely to a denial of reality. Some people occasionally on the show have accused me of simping for Donald Trump. For, for not attacking Donald Trump enough or frequently enough or being too positive about his chances of becoming the nominee. And I, I sometimes feel that those criticisms are shooting the messenger because, as I've said, I'm not endorsing anybody in the primary. I like Donald Trump. I don't hate Donald Trump. I like him. And I like Ron DeSantis. I think Ron DeSantis is a, is a great candidate. I think he's a great governor. I think he could be a good GOP nominee. I like other people in the, in the race, too. But I am not going to deny the reality that Donald Trump is almost certainly going to be the GOP nominee. It's not impossible that someone else could get it. He could, God forbid, drop dead. They could just lock him up forever. Like, who knows? But all all of the evidence available to us says that Trump is almost certainly going to be the nominee. And a lot of people in this primary are denying that. And the main way they deny it is by pretending 
that this is just an ordinary primary. It's not. You've got the former president running for a non-consecutive second term. We haven't seen that sort of thing in a very long time. He's up like 50 points in the polls. His organization is much more put together than the other candidates' organizations. He's a global celebrity and has been for 40 years. He has already been the president, so he's got a leg up because he can prove that he's done certain things that have been popular. He is uncommonly charismatic, in part because he's a Hollywood celebrity. Those are just facts. You might hate him. You might say some other guy would be a better president. Maybe the other guy would be a better president, but that's just a reality. And and one of the guarantors that uh, Donald Trump will be the nominee, if he is to be the nominee, is that everybody keeps denying reality. So all these people are sticking in the race. The fact that these candidates who are at one and two and three percent are still in the race, the fact that Doug Burgum, entertaining as he is, charming as he might be sometimes, is still in the race, the fact that Liz Cheney is considering entering into the race shows you that the Republican Party is denying political reality. And so long as they do that, the person whom reality at the moment tends to favor is most likely to prevail. It's now time to bring an end to the 18-year-long nightmare of the case of Stephen Avery and the murder of Teresa Halbach. Do not miss the season finale of Convicting a Murderer tomorrow. You know the story, and now we're exposing the truth. Candace is finally bringing you answers to all the questions, making a murderer created. Make sure you're caught up on episodes one through nine for the finale tomorrow, because you are not going to want to wait to see what was uncovered in the final episode. Here is a sneak peek at the season finale. Coming up on the finale of Convicting a Murderer. How were these filmmakers able to convince so many people that a man like Stephen Avery is innocent? The only story they wanted to tell was one of police corruption. They were committed to a story. She's doing a good job. She's doing a lot of investigation. They were looking into things for him. She knew more than the public defender and my uh, investigator. They were Stephen Avery's PR team. They convinced millions of people that they were innocent. Emails show that they were providing plenty of direction, that the Averys were to look like a close-knit family. Manitowoc County officers were to look suspicious. I think I will forever be obsessed with the media's ability to turn a villain into a hero or a hero into the villain. If they could do it to me, they can do it to anybody else. Make sure you tune in. It's the last episode of this saga. Bravo to Candace for doing fabulous work and exposing media lies. You can binge all 10 episodes tomorrow, but only if you're a Daily Wire Plus member. So sign up today at dailywire.com slash subscribe to watch the entire series. Do not miss the season finale of Convicting a Murderer tomorrow. Sign up today. My favorite comment yesterday is from Larry Oxentine, 8310, who says, a church building is just a building. The church is the people. It will never be destroyed. There is a lot of truth to that, but it's not totally true because the church is incarnational, because the faith is incarnational, because our Lord is incarnate of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, and became man. So, yes, we we don't want to make an idol out of physical things, but we don't want to deny the importance and the significance of physical things. Our Lord takes on flesh and dwells among us. I heard this a lot during covid Obviously, the, the more traditional uh, flavors of Christianity, up, up to and including especially the Catholic Church, are, place a great deal of emphasis on physicality, on sacraments, on rites, on rituals, on gestures, on right, sacrament being the meeting of the physical and the metaphysical. And so what I heard from some of my friends who are a little less uh, sacramentally inclined, who, who are Christian, is they would say, well, look, the church isn't a place. It's just, you know, it's it's a metaphysical thing. And yeah, it's metaphysical, but it's physical too. You know, what, what does our Lord do when he's resurrected and he goes to see his friends and he's standing, they're all out on the ship and he's he's out just on the on the beach. He's grilling them fish. It's like the fleshiest thing you can possibly imagine. He 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 spits in the dirt and smudges it on people's eyes to heal them. He breathes on the apostles. You know, there's a physical aspect here. And so, obviously, the comment is in response to Israel's destruction of part of this extremely old church that dates back at the very least to the 12th century and really has roots all the way back in antiquity in Gaza. And uh, I said, obviously, the state of Israel has a right to defend itself, but we need an explanation of why this happened. 
because the, the wanton destruction of ancient and religious architecture, art, relics, it, that is a very serious thing. We can't just throw our hands in the air and say, oh, well, the church is metaphysical. Yeah, it's, it's got a physical expression too in time and space and history. In fact, that's, that's perhaps the defining feature of the faith. Now, moving on from Liz Cheney, but still speaking of blonde women, Taylor Swift has turned her Eras Tour. It's this big tour where she went all around the country and it was sold out everywhere. And I had the misfortune of being in downtown Nashville on a night when the concert let out. And I felt like I was in a third world country. You couldn't get a car. There were a gazillion people flooding into the street. It was mayhem. People go crazy. When Taylor Swift announced her concert tour, every woman in this office, I walk in, you know, I show up here early. I'm here earlier than almost anybody. And the, the moment I come in, this is the very, very beginning of the workday. Just as I come in from my show, all the girls are refreshing the page to try to get the early tickets from American. People love Taylor Swift. I have never in my life consciously, intentionally listened to a Taylor Swift song. I couldn't, I couldn't name a Taylor Swift song. The one, I, the one exception to that is the, uh, the one about I'm a problem, it's you, or I'm a problem, it's me. I guess that would make more sense. Uh, because my producers made me listen to it, to react to it on the show. But I, do, I couldn't tell you what a Taylor Swift song is other than that. Well, she turned this best-selling tour into a movie. And the movie has held the number one spot at the box office for the second weekend. It surged well over $100 million. It's made history as the first concert film ever to cross the $100 million mark. Why? Why? I don't, am I going to have to go see this movie? Am I going to have, I avoided the Taylor Swift eras tour. I might have to go see it to make sense of this cultural phenomenon because I have an inkling of why Taylor Swift does so well. I don't mean to diminish Taylor Swift. She has a lot of things to recommend her. Is she Bach? Is she Mozart? No, I don't think so. Is she the greatest person? lyricist or musician or singer or dancer ever? No. Is she the most glamorous Hollywood star ever? No. Is she? No. And actually, I think that's why she's so popular. She's just kind of normal. And in, in another age, that would be fine and she might be popular. But in our age, which is so abnormal, which exalts abnormality, and bizarre things. People crave something that's normal. She's just kind of nice looking, blonde, doesn't have any tattoos, doesn't have any piercings, doesn't, when she makes statements about politics, they're relatively mild, center left, perfectly socially acceptable statement, acceptable to the ruling class, still basically acceptable to the populace. She sings songs about her ex-boyfriends. That's basically that's pretty much it. Everyone kind of, that's a relatable experience. There's nothing particularly profound in any of the songs. I'm not sure there's very much meaningful at all in the songs, but she's just kind of normal. And being kind of normal is enough in an age that has gone completely insane. And speaking of what people want, a very sad study came out showing that nearly one in four adults across the world report feeling very or fairly lonely. This is according to a meta Gallup survey. This is not just a survey of Americans or a certain age bracket. A new survey was taken across 142 countries, found that 24% of people age 15 and older self-reported feeling very or fairly lonely in response to the question, how lonely do you feel? The survey also found that the rates of loneliness were highest in young people. So you might expect older people, maybe whose friends have died, who have suffered all sorts of losses, lived a little bit, that they might be lonelier. No, it's younger people. The young people who are supposed to be out and constantly around other young people and going on dates and just surrounded by social life, they report being the loneliest. 27% of young adults aged 19 to 29 report feeling very or fairly lonely. And the, the lowest rates were actually found in older adults. Only 17% of people aged 65 and older reported feeling lonely. Why is this? Why is everybody so lonely? Part of it is that we are living in that, uh, how does it affect you culture? What we were talking about at the very top of the show, 
the culture which says, ignore social questions, ignore any uh, need for consensus, uh, any agreement on anything in society. How does it affect you? Let people do whatever decadent, divergent, depraved things they want to do. Just you do you and I'll do me and we'll, we'll just do different things. Well, a consequence of that is we're going to be more isolated. We're not going to have as much in common and we're not going to have as much to say to one another and we're not going to, we're going to feel alienated. That's part of it. But at a deeper level, why are people lonely? At a deeper level, the loneliness pandemic is directly attributable to the decline and sidelining of virtue. It comes down to that because true friendship is only possible among virtuous people. Good old Uncle Aristotle told us this millennia ago. There are, there are three kinds of friendship, we could say. Friendship of pleasure, you know, we both like meatballs and martinis. Friendships of utility, which is we, we can help each other professionally, say. And friendships of virtue, where people who are basically good, who practice virtue and tamp down vice, spend time with one another because they're both oriented toward the good and working toward the good. And when you are oriented toward and looking, working toward the good, you get happier. And when you're oriented toward and doing things that are bad, you get less happy. There's a good book by Alistair McIntyre, a, a still living philosopher called After Virtue. A highly recommended book because it, it talks about this very problem. We have sidelined virtue. We have forgotten about virtue. Many people in our culture mock the notion of virtue and they say it's illusory. And, and that's bad. And if you, if you don't care about virtue at all, you might end up in hell someday. You're going to have probably a miserable life. You're going to fall into bad habits. You're going to do all sorts of things. But one of the least discussed aspects of that is you're going to have a harder time making friends. I'm not saying that if you are lonely right now, it's because you are not virtuous. It's a social problem. If you live in, in a, just if living in a culture that denies and sidelines virtue is going to greatly increase the chances that you're going to be lonely and have trouble making friends. Because it's a social problem. It's not just about what you do. It's about what everybody does. But then there it is. There's the answer to that question. How does it affect you? How does it affect you if we pass some law? Well, because the law is a teacher and it, it molds the populace just as education molds children. Well, how does it affect you? It affects me because I live in a society and when you pass laws and when you have rituals and culture, that is going to warp the, the, the fabric in, in which I move, the fabric of the space in which I move, and that is going to create a certain kind of society, and that affects me a lot. The rest of the show continues now. You don't want to miss it. Become a member. Use code Knowles, Canada, WLES at checkout for two months free on all annual plans. 